Hi, my name is Fritzi Horseman. Welcome to Compassion in Action. My guest today is Dr. Bruce Perry. I'm so excited to have Dr. Perry on, on this podcast. He just finished and co-authored a book with Oprah Winfrey called What Happened to You, which asked the question, not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you? And I read this book, I gobbled it up in probably three days and read it again. And it is, it is a groundbreaking book. And what I'm so excited about is that this is, this is conversation is now on the national stage what happened to you instead of what's wrong with you. And we can apply that to basically anyone who has having a mental illness, who's feeling bad, who's depressed, who's addicted to something, even if it's work, which is me. Um, it applies to all of us, basically. It's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. And through this book and through this conversation, we learn, we learn that as we, as we forgive ourselves and forgive the people in our society, um, not only does that affect our lives, it also affects our brain because forgiveness and getting to the prefrontal cortex, getting to this part of the brain is really the goal. And in this conversation, Dr. Perry takes us through what it means to be a human, what it means to um, be dysregulated in the brain, what it means to um, be able to connect, find humanity, find culture, and begin the path to healing. I'm so excited to share this with you. Dr. Bruce Perry is the principal of the Neurosequential Network, senior fellow of the Child Trauma Academy, and a professor adjunct in the departments of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University in Chicago and the School of Allied Health, College of Science, Health and Engineering, La Trobe University, Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. Over the last 30 years, Dr. Perry has been an active teacher, clinician, and researcher in children's mental health and the neurosciences, holding a variety of academic positions. His work on the impact of abuse, neglect, and trauma on the developing brain has impacted clinical practice, programs, and policy across the world. Dr. Perry is the author with Maya Slavitz of The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog, a best-selling book based on his work with maltreated children and Born for Love, Why Empathy is Essential and Endangered. And of course, what happened to you? Dr. Bruce Perry, welcome to Compassion in Action. Thank you very much. I'm so honored to have you here. I just finished reading your book twice and I'm, I'm so delighted that you and Oprah Winfrey are changing the conversation from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. Um, I just want to, I want to start the conversation about, can you just tell us what you, what your definition of trauma is? Well, I, I actually, <laughs> I look at this from the perspective of somebody who studies the neurobiology of the stress response. And so for me, I think that uh, an experience, an event can be traumatic if it results in a change in the sensitivity and reactivity of your stress response systems in a way that compromises function. And, and, that, and that function broadly defined, physical, emotional, social, cognitive functioning. And um, now <clears throat> with that said, I think that the SAMHSA definition or the SAMHSA clarification about um, what is trauma is really helpful for a lot of people. And, and they've come up with kind of the three E um, configuration or structure about how to think about trauma. So there's the event, you know, that whatever that is, typically it's something that most people would point to and go, oh, that's clearly a bad thing. You know, it's a natural disaster, interpersonal violence, combat, physical abuse. Most people would go, wow, that has potential to be traumatic. The second thing that I think is really important and kind of speaks to what I was talking about is the experience of the person who's in the event. So you might be, two kids might be in the same school shooting and have a completely different internal response. Um, one child may actually, for a variety of reasons, not feel very threatened, and another child might be completely overwhelmed. 
Um, and then the third thing that is really important to think about is what are the effects? You know, what, what, are, what happens after the event is over, after the experience has been, uh, you know, influenced that person, then what are the effects of that? Are, are they 20 years later, vulnerability for heart disease, or is it 25 years later, uh, it, some aspect of that experience is interfering with your ability to form a healthy relationship? You know, that's, that's the kind of stuff that should be taken into consideration. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that's been a really a dilemma for our field is coming up with some consensus about how do you really define trauma in a way that you can, number one, explain it to people, and then number two, study it. So I think a lot of people that study trauma end up, um, you know, they, unintentionally falling into a little bit of a trap about language. And uh, so, I th for example, I think the ACE study is basically an example of that, that, you know, lots of people can have one of those ACEs, but it may not have had any impact on their development. Um, let's say divorce, right? You know, there are some kids where divorce has actually been handled very well by both parents. They do a great job of co-parenting. And so the, the experience of the child is, it's not great, it's not perfect, but it's not so overwhelming that it has these long-term destructive effects. And so I think these are the things that our field has, has to tease out a little bit. I agree, I agree. I think though, what the ACE study really discussed is what is the level of violence in the home? How do we how do we gauge how much violence is happening in the home? But I wanted before we talk about the ACEs because I have a, we did our own ACE studies. We surveyed over two thousand people in prison, and we have some stats to discuss. But I just wanted to go back about the definition of trauma. A lot of people in prison, and and actually, I thought this was true before I learned. I read Bessel van der Kolk's "The Body Keeps the Score," and that that opened my eyes that I was traumatized. I have eight aces. Um, but a lot of people think it's just a, a, war, a war veteran has trauma or somebody who's been in a car accident. And what it really is, from what I can tell, it's, it's events that happen. And for a lot of people, repeated, repeated events over a span of time. Right, and in fact, more people have been impacted um, from experiences that are almost imperceptible to other others. So the, it's the duration and the pattern of experience that makes the big difference. So when there's unpredictability and uncontrollability that can create the same physiological damage as a big capital T trauma where everybody go, oh, that's clearly traumatic. But if you're in a household where you're growing up and you are shunned by a parent or humiliated by a parent uh, or have other sorts of interpersonal uh, um, ruptures where your stress response gets activated in these uncontrollable ways, you can end up with the same kinds of trauma related problems as somebody who had a clearly uh, identifiable capital T trauma. And one of the things you also mentioned in the book is that when um, vets go to, when, pe when people go to war, a lot of their trauma, if they have a heart, if they get PTSD, it's based basically from their childhood trauma. Um, well, definitely you, you can, you're more vulnerable to being impacted by a new traumatic experience if you have this pre-existing baseline of uh, exposure to chaos, threat, child abuse, and so forth. And so studies of people who, you know, there's been a, a lot of different studies like this, but the classic example would be someone who goes into combat, has the same level of combat exposure as uh, other people, but this person will develop PTSD and it, because they have this vulnerability related to their earlier developmental trauma. And so, and so now to the, my studies in prison or my surveys that I did, so we, we, surveyed about 2000 uh, men and women and 64% had six or more aces. Um, Which is no surprise at all, you know. Exactly, I'm, and yeah. yeah. You know, and, and as you, you well know, I don't, I don't think there's anybody in prison who hasn't had many developmental adversities. And, 
you know, we've, we've done studies ourselves on the level of exposure to violence. It's like 95% of the people that are in juvenile justice or adult criminal justice settings have been exposed to extreme levels of violence at some point in their development. And developmental trauma, so can you explain, you know, briefly, I know it's like thousands yeah. of years of research that you've done, yeah. but can you explain- I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> I may look that old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> but thousands of volumes, let's just say. Um, can you explain um, what developmental trauma does and what it does to the development um, of the young of the young person? Yeah, I, I'm glad it's important that you ask that because I'll, one of the things that a lot of people don't appreciate is that the timing of a traumatic experience is really probably the most important factor. There's a lot of things that are involved in determining how much it will impact somebody, but the timing is really important. So let me just back up a second. And if you envision the human brain as this upside down triangle and the bottom is the kind of the brainstem, the lower part of the brain and the top is the cortex, the most uniquely human part of your body. And that's where you think and your values and when you learn geography and history and all that stuff goes up into your cortex. But that part of your body is that part of your brain is the last part of you to develop. It's not fully developed until you're probably 30 years old. So the, the brain develops sequentially from the bottom to the top. And so one of the things that happens early on, even in utero, is that there's a set of really, really important neurotransmitter networks, is basically neurons, that uh, originate in these low parts of the brain, but they send connections up and influence the development and functioning of all other parts of the brain. So if you have an intrauterine or early life trauma, these systems will get impacted and their activity and their functioning will be abnormal. But what that means is they'll then send abnormal signals for organization to the rest of the developing brain. And so you get this very pervasive impact on motor functioning and social functioning and emotional functioning and cognitive functioning. And that's why these early developmental experiences are so profoundly um, difficult to address. They, they really, in many ways, almost require a process that goes through development again and it replaces some of these abnormal patterns of experience and with more neurotypical, more patterned, more appropriate versions of stimulation so that those systems can get back towards normal. In, um, in, in your other book, the, one of your other books, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog, you talk about Leon, um, who you met in prison and who had severe developmental problems. And I was haunted when I read that book. I, I, I think about Leon all the time because basically his mother abandoned him in the crib, you know, innocently, but abandoned him in the crib and yeah. nothing developed, nothing developed for our society, for what our society would deem as appropriate. Yeah, you know, I've spent, I, I've interviewed a number of folks in prison. I've done some work with people on uh, around the death penalty and death penalty mitigation. And there's not a single one of those folks that I've interviewed that had what they needed to develop normally early in life. And it really was, not, again, it's not through any fault necessarily of their parents because their parents themselves had these terrible starts. And so, there's this uh, transgenerational, systemically fed inadequacy in the in, in in the developmental world that these individuals grew up in, and you know the hardest part for me, the saddest part, is that so many of the things that would make someone more empathic, more compassionate, more humane, less likely to do something that was aggressive, violent, and inhumane. These are really easy things to deliver. They're easy things to give if you make sure that the parent, the young parent has a place to live, has predictable food, has 
nurturing and is respected by neighbors, connected to culture, you know, things that really shouldn't be that hard to provide. But almost all of these stories and all of the narratives of the folks that I've talked with, there was tremendous fragmentation and disconnection, uh, overwhelmed caregiving, exhausted caregiving, maternal depression, people trying to deal with their own trauma by using a drugs to sort of deal with the pain, which of course makes it harder for you to be an optimal parent for a baby, you know, all, all kinds of things that if you knew the stories, it would all, it would make a lot of sense. Um, and if you, when you know, when you do know these stories, it just is heartbreaking that these are preventable things, you know, our society could prevent these things. Well, and I think, um, I mean, I think that's, that's up next. I think preventing these things is what we need to do, but uh, spreading this awareness about trauma is, is the first step. And that's, you know, back to, back to what you were, you and Oprah are doing so important to get this word out that what you're doing to your children, while it seems adaptive and correct, it's destroying, it's destroying their brains. Yeah, parents, parents are very powerful. You know, you can be powerful in these positive ways and, and you can be powerful in negative ways. And it's, again, I, I, I've, when you look at the majority of uh, uh, families that you work with where there's been an issue of abuse and neglect, almost none of it's intentional. You know, it's, it's all just these terrible, overwhelmed circumstances. And I think one of the things we run into a lot is we'll have a young parent who developmentally is quite immature, you know, so inside they're functioning like a six, seven, eight year old child in some areas, but they may be chronologically 25, old enough to have a child, but they're just developmentally not prepared to, to take care of a kid. And you know, parenting is a really hard thing to do, even when you have all the resources at hand. And but when you're on your own, and you have no no money, you have no predictability about where you're going to live. You're not in healthy relationships. Um, it's just really a tough tough thing to do. And you know, I had a child at 43, but I was I've been living in a hypervigilant state all of my life. And so, you know, when there was chaos, when he would drop something or whatever, I would react and yell and scare him. You know, that's, that, that was what I inherited being in my mother's womb, being in her, she was adopted as a child. So she was abandoned. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have generational trauma that I'm still unpacking and unpacking with my son. And so yes, I think I was immature as well as a mother, even though I, though I was 43, I was still had some immature um, tendencies, you know, like eight or nine years old, I would say. And so we're like children parenting yeah. our children. Well, and, and the, the thing that's important to remember though, to just sort of let yourself off the hook a little bit is that human beings were never intended to be parented by one person. We are intended to be cared for by, you know, the term is allo parenting. You know, there's grandparents and aunties and older siblings around so that there's not one person responsible for every single aspect of the health and welfare of the child. We're the only culture in the, on the history of the planet that's asked a single parent to meet all of these needs physical, emotional, social, cognitive needs of, of a child, of multiple children all by uh, yourself. It's a really, it's, it, it's a burden that is unrealistic. And I think so many parents beat themselves up about feeling inadequate when they're just being human. I mean, it's, it, 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 everybody is going to pass, it has some junk that they've inherited, everybody does. And there's gonna be some time during development when your junk is, is, go, is gonna, be the wrong thing for where your child is in their development. And so this is where you would hope that an auntie or a grandma or an uncle would step in and go, go take a walk, I got this. But we're not doing that anymore. I mean, and this is, this is really to our society's detriment that we're not, that we're doing child rearing in isolation so much. Yes. and. And it, we're also, we're all isolated. The pandemic really magnified it, but we're, 
we're not functioning well. We're it's levels of PTSD from just being isolated. Um, but so one question I have is when we're, when we're in fight or flight, when we're dysregulated, um, just can you talk more about being regulated and dysregulated and what, how that, how that applies to the brain and how the brain is functioning? Sure. So again, if you envision this upside down triangle version of the brain, um, you've got parts of your brain that allow you to think and reflect on the past and think about the future. And that's the top part of your brain, the cortex. And when that part of the brain is fully mature and online, you can get hungry, thirsty, and cold and get all, and, and you feel this lower in your brain. And, and then the, the top part of your brain basically tries to tell you stuff like, I, oh, I, I recognize that sensation, you're hungry, but I know you're gonna be able to eat in an hour because that's when it's gonna be lunchtime, it'll be noon, and you're gonna be able to take a break from whatever and go have lunch. And so there's a way to top down regulate when your brain's organized. So when your brain's fully organized and you have access to your cortex, you can use that, what we call executive functioning capability. So you say to yourself, all right, I can tolerate the discomfort of being hungry for a little while because I know that I'm going to be able to go eat. Um, or if your boss is a real jerk to you and you want to call him names or you want to have a temper tantrum right there, that your cortex basically says, hold your tongue, don't say that, wait till he leaves and then blow up and call him, a, you know, whatever. So you, this this is sort of, and we talk about this in our field and a lot of people have probably heard the term executive functioning. That has to do with the strength of this top part of your brain to kind of modulate the more primitive, immature, regulatory parts of your brain. And so things that, that get you out of balance that sort of uh, make things that you need to kind of contain like hunger, thirst, cold, frustration, anger, fear, that all has to do with activating these lower stress related networks down here. So there's this top down mechanism, but when you are an infant, you don't have a cortex that's been developed yet. So the moment you get hungry, you cry out or you act, you, you let the world know and the intention is, of course, to somehow somebody will come and feed you or care for you or whatever. Um, but as you get older, the cortex gets a little bit stronger, a little bit stronger, and, um, and you can use some top-down regulation. The bottom line, the, the most important aspect of regulation, however, is that you have these systems in the lower part of your brain that were organized in utero. When you were a little fetal baby, fetal baby, little fetus, um, your, your body was sending signals into the lower part of your brain saying, I'm not hungry, I'm not thirsty, I'm not cold. And, and the, the sensory apparatus of the fetus wa was getting continuous pattern, repetitive, rhythmic input from maternal heart rate and all of the sub multiple rhythms of that. So 40, 60, 80, and so your brain made an association between pattern, repetitive, rhythmic activity and being regulated. And so after you're born, when the baby cries, we replicate that intrauterine environment. We swaddle kids up and we use that pattern, repetitive, rhythmic activity, both in the way we look and look away, our tone of voice is more baby talk, it's more rhythmic. We actually literally move kids in this, in this rhythm. And so our brain gets further reinforcement about the regulating capabilities of pattern repetitive rhythmic activity. And so as we get older, we incorporate that into our self-regulatory toolkit. You know, kids who are playing Legos and they're just learning how to be toilet trained, they feel their bladder get full, it gets full, it gets full, and they don't want to stop playing. So instead of, they, they literally will rock themselves back and forth. Now that has nothing to do with bladder control. It only has to do with being able to tolerate the dysregulating input that you have a full bladder. 
And when you get nervous as a public speaker, you know, you may pace or you may sway at the podium or you may have some sort of little hand thing that you do. People do needlework, people do running, you know, people learn to dove and people do bilateral tapping, EMDR, you know, traditional indigenous uh, rituals involve pattern, repetitive rhythmic stuff. So it's, it's pervasively part of uh, a human being's toolkit for regulating is some form of pattern repetitive rhythmic activity. And, uh, and again, it's, you know, it's, the idea is that you're taking these stress response networks that are getting activated and activated and activated because they're getting some signal that hungry, thirsty, cold or whatever, but you're tapping into this pre-existing regulatory mechanism to kind of keep you contained a little bit. And, and we do it all the time. I mean, I, 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 I don't know, I'll have a really lousy day and I'm like, I need to go for a walk. I need to go for a run. I need to work out or, or I need to listen to music or something like that. And I would bet everybody listening has some form of that self-regulatory capability. But the idea is basically we have these systems that function like a thermostat. And when we get out of our range, we need to, something has to get us back to the right temperature, so to speak. And so if we get too hungry, we have to eat and it'll get us back to equilibrium. If we get scared, we have to do something to get regulated. And so there are, are you know, there's this top-down regulation, which is something that if you're really mature, have a really well-organized cortex, you can use it. But if your cortex is undeveloped and you're threatened, because threat actually, the first thing it does is it starts to shut down the cortex. So th this is a really important thing for people in prison. Many of them got there because part of their criminal activity involved doing something when they didn't have full access to their cortex. You know, if you sit down with them and talk with them, they go, of course, I know that was dumb. Of course, I know that the consequences of that. And, and, but, and why did you do that? I, I wasn't thinking. And they weren't thinking. They literally, in that moment, something happened that their cortex was only partially accessible. And one of the greatest things about, uh, you know, one of the most important things that can happen when you are in prison is that you engage in some form of cortex building activity like read, learning to read or increasing your literacy level. That's the number one anti-recidivism intervention that's ever been out there. And, and basically it's not necessarily that you're going to go out into the workforce and be able to fill out a job application. It's because reading builds cortex. So if you do anything if you read, if you get involved in learning the songs of your culture, anything that's culture bound that you participate in, in prison is gonna make your cortex stronger and give you a better chance when you get out in the world and have evocative cues that wanna make you dysregulate, it's, you're gonna have more executive functioning power that will help you, you know, su succeed in an environment, in a world that's trying to make you blow up. And meditation would be another. Absolutely. Exactly. One of the things we're doing with the people in prison, we're having them write poems and essays and, and, a great idea. and create artwork and create books so that they have, first of all, they have something that they can see and create and that they know they've done the sense yeah. of agency, but also I didn't even realize this. It's like the, weightlifting. It literally is weightlifting for the cortex. Reading is weightlifting for the cortex, but so is art. So and anything that the interest, the human cortex is part, the part of us that is involved in managing complex social environments, which is, so if you think of anything cult that's cultural, that, that binds you to another group of people, that is gonna build your cortex. Music, performance art, reading, uh, you know, that kind of stuff and a certain sport 
you know, certain things that you do. You, you, there are motor activities that can build your cortex, but not just, I mean, uh, the more complex they are, the more they involve other people. So in other words, playing basketball can build your cortex. Learning how to contain yourself when you get fouled and not blow up, that is gonna help build your cortex. You get practice, 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 and you can build resilience and you can build cortex and, and it will make it easier for you to make the transition into the world. Now, just I'll, I'll, everybody who's been in prison and left will tell you the world is designed to make people, it, it really, it doesn't have you in mind, right? <laughs> it's, it, is, it, it does not care about you. The systems that are supposed to help you don't care about you. They care about the system. So there are going to be all kinds of aspects of these systems that will be provocative, dysregulating. And the more you can sort of build your brain's capacity to tolerate that stuff and let it pass, the more successful you're going to be. Um, but as long as you have that reactivity and sort of the undeveloped cortex, you are going to be so easily provoked back into the system that it's, and, and honestly, I don't, I, I could, this is a whole different lecture, but part of that's intentional. Part of that's when we talk about systemic racism or systemic, there, there is, there are aspects about the way our systems are organized that are intended to keep certain people at the top and other people at the bottom. And, um, you know, whenever you hear somebody say, well, that's just the way we've always done it, that's part of that, that's part of that institutional encrustment that keeps our systems uh, structured in ways that, that keep the powerful at the top and the least powerful at the bottom. Yes, it's a whole nother lecture, I agree. Um, the thing I want to talk about is when you're dysregulated in prison, which is most prison can sometimes be very um, violent, stressful. Um, there's a stress, there's a stress. You can walk into a prison and feel the stress in there or the feel the threat. There's like a feeling of threat. So how do we regulate ourselves in an environment like that? I mean, I know you just gave us some examples of, of what we can do. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I, you know, what I hear and see from the people that I know that are in prison or have been in prison is that one of the most powerful things is to connect with a group. You know, there's an absolute, literally, if you are, on, if you are not connected to a group, you're unbelievably vulnerable. And so now, of course, this is tapping into this neurobiological property of human beings to create an us and them. But it's highly adaptive in that environment. I, I mean, I don't, it, it's almost impossible uh, uh, to not have some uh, relational affiliation that helps protect you and keep you safe. Right, but we want to evolve from us versus them, right? The idea is we that can't. we- We can't, human beings can't, it's our biology. We won't evolve away from it, but we can understand it. I mean, it's a, if we understand that that's the way we're organized and that we will be pulled to do that, you can have an us that is organized around positive values and positive things as opposed to hateful, racist, anti-Semitic values. I mean, unfortunately, and, and we do this, you can create healthy groups that have an organizing belief system that is more about altruism or more about kindness, more about goodness. So you can do that, but we cannot, we will never get around the us and them. It's just, it's a, it's, it's at the absolute core of human genetics to, that we are relational creatures. And um, so. But isn't that more when it's more, it's more prevalent when we're, when we're stressed or when we're. Um, absolutely. Yeah. As the, we, more threat, the more threatened we are. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's absolutely the case. The more threatened you are, the more you shut down the value based part of our brain. So you may have really good quote values about what's right and wrong, about the goodness of people, about your belief system. But when you're under threat, you basically start to act in a more reactive, primitive, uh, aggressive way. And you're pulled and your 
the boundaries of the group you're affiliated with when it's under threat get tighter and tighter and, and more reactionary. And the solutions to the problems become more primitive and ultimately get driven towards violence. You know, that, that the solution to conflict is power. And, you know, the, 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 and again, prisons are permeated with that because a lot of people are feeling threatened and a lot of people are already starting out with these trauma related shifts in their internal state. So those, those environments are highly vulnerable to um, any kind of, I would say, ism or belief system that, that, that emphasizes us and them and sometimes artificially creates, um, <clears throat> you know, uses hate and fear to create those boundaries. Um, I don't know if you read the book, in the book, um, do you remember the part where Oprah's talking about the guy on death row? Uh, Hinton, yes. Yeah, yes. What, have you read his book? Uh, uh, no, but I've seen you, you should read his book, it's unbelievable. And it really is a great example of how these men were able to get through their pre-existing us and them organization to, to create a sense of connection. It was really very moving. Well, that's the thing. There's a, they have the correctional officers and they have the prison residents and there's an us versus them mentality. And then they have the subdivisions with the races and the, and the, the gangs. Yeah. And what I found in the groups that, that I led is that when we're in circle, the boundaries um, the boundaries and the divisions seem to melt and there's right. more of a connective tissue. And I think that's, that's because they feel safe. First of all, they feel safe in that, in that room. And second of all, they start seeing that what, what connects us is some of our, what we've been through. We've been through, you exactly. know, childhood trauma. Right. And so it's, I think it's in those circles that we can find our common, our humanity, both inside prison and outside prison. Policemen- well, and I, what I would, and I think you're right, but I think what you're also doing is you're creating a different us. You know, every single per, every single person who's listening has a a bunch of groups, right? It's not like there's just one group that you belong to. You have you have a group of folks that you connect with at work, and there are things that tie you to them at work, and then you have a group of friends that might be the friends that you had in high school and. And, or college and, and and that may be a different set of groups and different things connect you. And then you have kind of your family. And so a healthy person in the modern world is able to have permeability between these different groups and, and still maintain positive affiliation in these groups. And, and one of the things that many of these individuals in prison experience, part of the dilemma that got them in the into trouble in the first place is that they didn't have healthy groups to belong to. Right. They weren't, they were a lot of them adrift at one point or another and then sucked up into a group that was organized around not such healthy stuff. And what you're offering, which I think is wonderful, is an ability to create a sense of us bonding together with a whole variety of common elements of sort of tough starts or other things, which I think in the end is a very, very powerful glue um, to, for people to kind of see others in a humane way. Well, could the goal be to create a global us? Uh, I mean, so that we're all connected, we see our, I mean, we have differences and <clears throat> And we double down on those differences instead of saying, you know, but ultimately we all want the same thing. We want to feel safe. We want a family. We or you know, some people don't want families, but we want a a, a, a nurturing, healthy life. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, I think that's a good aspiration. You know, and I and I know some people that that I mean, you probably know some people too who have this incredible this peacefulness about them and they have the wonderful capacity to be understanding and patient and present with all kinds of folks and whether they're tired or burned out or not they're always able to sort of have that 
ability to to um, join with others. Whereas I think a lot of people are more like me. We're like, you know, when I'm rested and when I feel, you know, you know, it's a lot easier than when you're impinged on by all of the stuff of life. I think it's one of the hardest things to do is to is to stay regulated enough to keep your to to be a value driven person. You know, even the most wonderful person I know. You know, you, I think about this all the time that, that there are people that are really l- smart, loving, kind, good values. And, and then they go out into the world, they go to work and they're sitting around, they're busy, busy, busy. And, and what happens, most people don't appreciate it, but when you're busy, 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 part of your cortex kind of shuts down. And what you're really driven by is sort of the relational cues and the, the, the longing to belong. And so somebody who's in your group makes a racist joke and you find yourself laughing. <clears throat> and then you realize, oh my gosh, I shouldn't laugh at that. And, mm-hmm. and it, particularly as you move, leave away from the group, you, you go, wow, the next time I'm gonna call them on that or whatever. Now, and you may do that. But the interesting thing is when you get around other people in the, in the midst of sort of everyday busyness, all kinds of things will shift in what is driving and rewarding you in that moment. And, it, and in that moment, what drives you is relational reward, not value-based reward. And so a lot, there aren't a lot of people, like I said, that are able to stay in that, always in that state where they're being driven by their values as opposed to being uh, state dependent in the way they um, manage their, how they act. It's so true. My my family were they were making a terrible joke the other night, and I was just like, "Do you guys would know what you're doing?" Right. And yeah, it's it's unacceptable, and yet I wanted to laugh with them because I wanted to be connected to my family. Exactly, and I have to say, one of the things that happened with me is that I've gotten a little bit older and a little bit more secure. In honestly, I don't really give a shit about what people think about me anymore, so <laughs> that helps a lot. So I'm I'm much more willing to kind of call people on the stuff that I used to sort of be reluctant to do. And, um, but I think that that's something that comes with some level of sense of interpersonal safety and security. Whereas before, like in high school or college, you know, you just don't feel that secure with yourself and you kind of go along with the humor or the whatever. And it's amazing how you can get four or five pretty smart folks will get together and they'll drink a little bit and all of a sudden they'll be doing something that's like the dumbest thing. Not, not a single one of them would have independently come up with the idea to do whatever the thing is. Uh, but together they get stupider and they, and they get more primitive. And not, now some, sometimes what they do is harmless, but sometimes what they do is dangerous and hurtful to other people. And, um, and I, again, I think part of what, what our challenge is, people, our challenge, you know, the people that know about these things like you and I, is to continue to educate people about trauma, about how the brain works, about how we're all vulnerable to implicit bias, about all, all kinds of stuff. Because if you don't know about it, then you, um, you're, you kind of fall into these little landmines all the time. And, um, but I think if you know about some of these things, you can be a little bit more intentional about how you how you do things. I agree, absolutely. Um, one of the things I wanted to make sure we talk about is reg- the, the regulate, relate, reason, right. the three R's that you talk about. Because I really think, because we start from the lower part of our brainstem, right? And mm-hmm. that's how we judge a situation. We start down here and it's yep. it's not until we feel safe that we can actually be here. Exactly. Right. And so, again, going back to that upside down triangle version of the brain, all of the incoming information from this present moment, you know, people who are listening, the, when they hear this, the, the first neurons that are getting activated from the sound that I'm making goes into the lower part of their brain first. And then it will get processed and sometimes acted on, but then it'll go get passed up to the emotional part of the brain. And then it finally gets up to the thinking part of the brain. So there's this, 
and this is a gross oversimplification, but there's kind of like this three part processing of experience that happens all the time. There's this very primitive processing that's in the lower part of the brain. That's, that's if you act on information at that level, it's almost always sort of a knee jerk reactive, you know, we use the term reaction, it's a reaction. If it gets up to the middle part of the brain and the middle part of your brain decides I need to act on this, it tends to be more of an emotional reaction. And then if it gets up accurately to the top part of your brain, you can actually have a thoughtful reaction. And so what we know is that under stress, and we've talked about this, that the top part of your brain is harder to access. It kind of shuts down. And so if you want to actually reason with somebody, if you want them to understand your argument, if you want them to learn a new cognitive concept or see your point, you have to make them feel regulated enough that what you're saying will actually get up into their brain, into the top part of their brain. And it's remarkable how frequently, even with people you love and people you feel safe with, how often we make these little ruptures in communication. And just think about how often you say, that's not what I meant to say, or uh, you're, not, you're not hearing me, or let me clarify that. And that's basically related to that process of, you know, there's this filtering of experience where when, when you hear somebody say something and it might be the way they look at you or a tone of voice, all of a sudden you're off to the races thinking, oh, you don't like my hair. You know, I, I literally just had this with my wife. She came in and, and, I, and I, don't mean, I don't mean to say this in a negative way, but I think a lot of people can relate to this, right? She comes in, she's got her hair cut and she goes, do you like it? I go, yeah, it's really nice. And then, oh, I, I, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, it's really nice. And there, clearly there was something signal I was giving off that made her feel like I wasn't really seeing her. And, that, and it was because I had to be on a podcast in like three minutes. And it was like, I can only do so much hair therapy. Um, but, but, you know, it was one of those examples of, you know, I really intended to communicate that I, I really did like her hair, but I was just so preoccupied that I was giving her signals that, you know, I'm just kind of giving to the default. Yeah, your hair is great. And she didn't, she didn't really feel what I was saying. So it kind of went up part way and it reminded her of another dismissive interactions that she's had. And then, so the cognitive part of what I said was just sort of diffused and inaccurate in her head. And so I had to calm down and go, no, really. I really liked your hair and, <laughs> and it would, it finally sunk in. And then, but that we all, we have these little moments all the time, right? Just off topic. I really don't think men notice women's hair. I just don't think that my, they're like, you got your hair cut. What happened? I mean, honestly, it's not a question we should ask men. We should ask our girlfriends. Um, well, it's, you know, and it, I, I think a lot of it's about details, right? I mean, I can walk into my house and I'll have come back from it traveling or something. And, you know, I, I get this feeling like this, something's different. I don't even know what it is. And I, you know, a week later, you know, my wife will sort of say, I've been waiting, you know, this is a new chair in the living room. We've had it for a week. I'm like, uh, it's nice, <laughs> I guess. Anyway. Um, so, but here's the question when we're, when we're in the triangle and we're at the bottom and yeah. let's say somebody criticizes me to me that, that put, that'll put me right Absolutely. That'll just stop. That'll stop the the ascension into the cortex, I'll, or right. they'll, um, or you know, because I my father was an alcoholic, so I was always gauging to see is he drunk and is she, she going to get mad? Like I was always gauging, and I was always on this, what's going to happen? So I was never, I was never in my cortex during that time because I was basically on alert. Right. So the conversations only happen when we're in the the cortex. Well, but see, what you probably developed was this incredible capacity to read nonverbal cues, that you can read a room really quickly and you can tell whether or not a point's getting across. I mean, you probably have that, that sort of, that skill set. And because when you're in an environment like that, like you're describing, words don't mean that much. What really means it a lot is gate. And is the tie, is his tie a little crooked? 
um, you know, is there a tiny little slur in the language? Not what he said, but is there a tiny little slur? All of those little cues that if you're not used to it, you might not pick up on it. But if you, you've got this, you're attuned to all the nonverbal cues, you would pick up on that. And that, again, I, I think all of these in some ways are these little gifts that we get from our, the bad things that happen in our life, you know? It's, it's just, do we find the niche where that gift is gonna be a good thing to do? So again, a lot of people who have a background like yours end up being incredibly good uh, interviewers in law enforcement or interviewers in social work or like Oprah one of the reasons Oprah was an is an incredibly attuned interviewer and is that she's had this history of trauma where she's able to really be empathic with people and, and sit with their story that's one of the observations I had about Oprah is she created a community circle for us every every day at three o'clock. I mean, right. I think her healing that she did for us in in the community she created was, you know, something I think we're all we've all mourned when she stopped doing the show. It right. was a very powerful community uh, space that she created. Even if it was just an interview, a one on one interview, you still felt like you were part of that community. And um, I mean, that's, that's the miracle of Oprah, I think. Um, but that's also the miracle of healing for all of us, right? Is being in community. Yeah. Is prisons are designed to be isolating and, you know, the opportunities for community, especially in a maximum security prison are very difficult. But I think, what are your thoughts or how do we begin the process of healing in prisons? If you really want to make people uh, get better, you need to bet, you need to understand everybody's individual story. You need the, you can, one size doesn't fit all. Every, there are lots of different individual reasons why these folks ended up where they are. And if you did that, and if you started to meet them where they were developmentally and give them opportunities to send, start to catch up, you would have a much lower recidivism rate you would have all kinds of uh, folks who could be tremendous contributors to society. And, um, you know, I wish, I wish there would be more of that, but I don't think that, I think that until those systems begin to really learn a lot about development and developmental trauma, that's probably not going to happen that much. Well, that's my mission is, trauma-informed prisons in the next three years and actually healing centers, all of them, all 1,833 prisons become healing centers because if you've committed a crime, there's trauma behind it. Yeah, well, and, and you know this probably way better than I do, but I, the largest uh, mental health institution in the United States is the prison system. Yes. And you know, the number of unmet mental health needs is just heartbreaking. Um, and there's, it's, yeah. there's a stigma um, within the prison system, within the people, both on, for the correctional officers, but also for the prison residents, that they don't come forward with their mental health issues when they're feeling depressed, when they're feeling anxious, when they're unable to control their um, startle responses or whatever is presented, their depression. Um, and how do we like unearth the stigma from this and make mental health a priority and something that isn't culturally um, taboo. Yeah, I, there's so much fear that's about people that are in prison or have gotten out of prison that sort of has been exploited by political interests that I think that the whole effort at trying to do some of this stuff is, is it's gonna be, as we say in North Dakota, tough sledding. Um, but I think it's worthwhile. It's worth doing. I mean, the, the amazing thing is there are so many remarkable, productive, creative people who have been in prison and who are still in prison. And I, you know, we just have to figure out a way to tap into that sort of pool of expertise and um, in ways that will help them. And then ways that will help them help contribute to our culture, which I think 
um, there's just so much untapped creativity, productivity. I mean, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's a shame actually. Billions of dollars worth. Yeah. Um, a couple more questions. One of the things you talk about in your book is the functional IQ, which yeah. fascinated me because when I'm triggered, like in the kitchen, the kitchen is a, a zone where I get really triggered because my mother would have a knife in the kitchen. My mother would slap me in the kitchen. It was a really small space. Mm -hmm. So I, I find myself becoming nonverbal. Like I, I'll say, can you, I can't even talk when somebody's in my way to get a spoon. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm, is that a, a, an evidence of functional IQ or what is functional IQ? So I, I don't like the, the term IQ very much because of all the connotations about it, but basically I use it because people think of it as a reflection of your ability to problem solve and think, right? So what we know is that when you're in a state where you're feeling safe, you're not hungry, you're not thirsty, you're not cold, the, the environment's not overstimulating, uh, you're able to use your cortex, the smartest part of your brain in a very effective way. So if you were solving a problem or trying to solve a problem, you'd come up with a solution that would be probably for you the most creative that you could. But if you were faced with the same problem when you were feeling hungry, thirsty, cold, or distressed, anxious, angry, the solution would be reflective of a much less mature person. So you kind of solve problems like an eight-year-old as opposed to a 50-year-old or whatever, however old somebody is. And so that's sort of what I mean by functional IQ. It, when you're under threat, your functional IQ, your problem-solving capability diminishes. And we see this all the time. I mean, we'll have kids that have chronic stress and or trauma in their lives. They will be tested and they'll get an IQ of 85 or 80. But then when you interact with them, you go, wait a minute, this kid's way smarter than somebody who's got a below average IQ. And then you realize that they were, when they were tested, they felt distressed, you know, it was challenging, it was overwhelming. And so this was a gross underestimate of what they can really do. And I think this is probably true with a lot of people in prison that, you know, whenever they were evaluated, it was under circumstances that anybody being evaluated like that would not perform at their best. And so we have these underestimates of what the potential of all these folks are. And um, again, it's, it's, you know, to our detriment in the long run, actually. Yes, but I believe in them and I believe I'm going to make sure we, we activate their functional IQ their and their, their capabilities and their possibilities. Um, but you talk about the power of healing and community. Yeah. And um, can you just say a little bit more about that? Why, I know we're social creatures, but why is that so important? And why do we need communities in prison instead of isolation and dehumanization? Well, human beings are relational creatures. Literally our physical, social, emotional health are all dependent upon the number and quality of positive little relational interactions we have day in and day out. And when a person is in isolation, when there are fewer interpersonal interactions, when there's less touch, less conversation, less eye contact, less, less of all of the things that go with being in relationship, they're much more likely to be dysregulated, be at risk for physical health problems, social health problems. And it really is the last thing you wanna do with anybody that you wanna remediate or anybody you wanna heal. Um, so what we know is that because of the way the brain changes, it ch the brain changes with repetition and, and basically practice. You know, you get, you get more repetition, repetition, repetition. And so it's not, it's not having one big block of experience a week, like one hour of therapy that really leads to meaningful change. It's having thousands of tiny little doses of, real, of, of positive interaction throughout a whole week that lead to meaningful change. And it's these tiny, li the, the, these little interactions come from the people in your social milieu. They come from the people you work with, live with, and so forth. And so if you envision a prison environment where there's 
only one hour a day where somebody can have an opportunity for some of these relational interactions, which I'm sure even under those circumstances are highly regulated, you're basically diminishing the healing opportunities and the regulation opportunities and the reward opportunities for those people, which means you are going to increase the probability that they're going to stay tuned up and reactive and likely to be aggressive in interactions. Number two, they're much more likely to seek out and try to obtain unhealthy forms of reward, like seek out drugs, seek out, you know, all kinds of things that, that are not good for you, as opposed to benefit from positive reward, like interacting with another human being. And then number three, almost everything that we learn is, is uh, in context of a relational interaction. So you can read a book, certainly, and that you will learn. But the truth is, you really learn most about a book when you talk about it with somebody, or talk about a concept in the book with somebody. And so again, read uh, Mr. Hinton's book. And he talks about starting a, a book club on death row. And it's the conversational part of that where the concepts really get stuck in, you know, put into your head. So when you diminish relational opportunities, you're basically decreasing learning opportunities, decreasing reward opportunities, decreasing regulating opportunities, increasing the probability that there'll be aggressive violence under socialization, unhealthy forms of reward seeking, and you're increasing the probability that there'll be recidivism and, and more injury to society when these folks leave. And it's, it's one of these things where very often the, 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 the programs within these systems are cutting off their nose to spite their face. Dr. Bruce Perry, thank you so much for your time, your expertise. We didn't get to getting to the cortex. Maybe you can just say one quick thing about that because I think that's, that's our goal. Um, well, we kind of talked about it, right? I mean, that, you know, that when you're calm, when you're regulated, you, the, your cortex is open for business. And so if you don't create a respectful, relationally enriched uh, environment for somebody, you're gonna have a really hard time getting to their cortex. So again, it, in the end, you, you, that's the most powerful part of our body, the most uniquely human part of us. And if we wanna influence it and change it in any positive way, it has to be accessible. So we need to create programs and practices for people that make it easier for them to have full access to their cortex. Dr. Perry, once again, thank you again. And, You're welcome. And I will make sure every prison in the United States gets to hear this interview. Thank you again. Appreciate the opportunity. And I appreciate the work you do. Keep it up. I will. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Bye. See ya. Thank you for watching my interview with Dr. Bruce Perry. I just found that interview so exciting and so illustrative of what needs to happen in our society, both in prisons and in our communities. Healing happens in community, not in isolation. And let's find ways to create community, to create connection, and to create our neural pathways, get our brains really synced up so that we can begin the healing process. Um, as usual, Please like, subscribe, and share this podcast. Please tell your friends about it. And please, um, please get his book and Oprah's book. It's so fantastic and it really, really transformative for me. Really eye-opening um, book. And, you know, perhaps as he suggests, book clubs. Let's start a book club. Let's start a book club and talk about what happened to us. It's not what's wrong with us. It's what happened to us. Thank you.